Okay, let's talk a little bit more about uh, translations. We got a spectrum from literal on the one end to a free or a paraphrase on the other end. And in the middle we have the dynamic equivalent or the functional equivalent. And uh, there's values for every one of those. What's the value for a paraphrase? I'm just talking to Ken about this before class. What's the value of reading a free or a paraphrase? Like the, uh, the Living Bible, uh, J.B. Phillips, uh, New Testament, or the Message is the most popular one. What's, what's the value of that? It bridges that historical gap, doesn't it? And the language gap, going from one language to the other, and suddenly, boom, you're right there and you understand it. And uh, hopefully there's a freshness and a vibrancy, and you, the, you've read that passage maybe dozens of times in a literal translation and kind of <coughs> went right by you, but now you see, oh my goodness, that's vibrant. Okay, yeah, it's helpful. Now, uh, in a sense, technically, these paraphrases are not translations, technically. Um, but they still have value. Uh, I wouldn't use it as my main study Bible, <laughs> if I were you. Um, but I would have a copy of, of one of these. Uh, the Living, Phillips, uh, Phillips uh, New Testament is really interesting. It's, it's an older version, but really it was one of the first, and it was very, very vivid. Um, and uh, the message, yeah, have that, and it's in a lot of different forms now. But uh, there, there is value in that, okay? We're not just going to say, oh, these are for children. No, they're for adults too. They're for all of us, and, and they have a specific value. I would say it's more of a, a devotional and kind of get extra insight, and that insight then you want to check it uh, against the other two, the, uh, the dynamic or functional equivalent, and then against the little. Make sure, you know, it's okay if you're going to base your life on that insight, okay? But there is value in it, okay? I'm not going to slam dunk those. All right, how about uh, the dynamic equivalent, functional equivalent in the middle here? What's the value of that, all right? Smaller vocabulary pool. So especially if English is your second language, wow, this is a gift, isn't it, from God? Thank you very much and uh, very helpful. Okay? And, and, of course, then for younger uh, folks, too. Uh, it's interesting, I was teaching uh, a group of 15-year-olds, uh, and uh, they were all orphans. And uh, so, you know, their educational experience was maybe uh, a little checkered or a little sketchy uh, compared to others. And uh, so we tried to use the NIV with them, and, and even for 15-year-olds, it was, it was, there were words they didn't know, and, and we found that the Good News Bible today's English version, had an either, even smaller vocabulary base than the NIV. I think it, the NIV is about 800 vocabulary words total, and the good news is around 500. So, it, it really, just that much easier. And uh, I think, too, the, the NLT, the New Living uh, Translation, is even easier to read than the uh, NIV. Is that, have you, any of you discovered that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Putting those numbers out, is that for the, just the New Testament? No, I think that's for the whole Bible. The whole Bible, yeah. words. Yeah. Wow. All the names and everything. Well, yeah, it doesn't include the names, oh, okay. but just in terms of, because uh, that's a kind of a special vocabulary, but just in terms of the normal vocabulary, the uh, English words that you need to know, somewhere is closer to 500. Yeah, that's pretty amazing that you could yeah. get that low. Now, compared to uh, two to 5,000 in a literal translation, so you can see there's a lot more precision and differentiation in a literal while uh, a dynamic might use the same word for you know, two or three different concepts and not make those distinctions. So, so it's easier to read, smoother reading. I highly recommend it if you're reading a long biblical book and trying to get the big picture, read a dynamic or functional equivalent. You won't be exhausted at the end, especially if it's Isaiah. 66 chapters, okay? You'll be exhausted if you read a literal. You know, you'll have to go to bed for a couple of days. So, <laughs> uh, so there, there is, what are, what's a couple of downsides to the dynamic or functional equivalent? What would be a couple of negatives? Okay, all right. You, it's user-friendly trying to give you smaller chunks with headings over those little chunks so you can find things more readily. And, uh, and so that's helpful, but what you give up is uh, the, the technical unit of thought. Um, 
And that's a pretty big price to pay, in my opinion. So if you're going to read and study and teach from a, a, a dynamic equivalent, I would suggest you also have a literal translation. And, and for the passage you're going to teach, look and see what the literal paragraph is. And, and cover that in your teaching. Otherwise, you might be just getting two or three verses out of the middle of a paragraph in your dynamic equivalent translation. No, it's not as precise as uh, the original language. And, uh, what we're, and we're going to see this uh, with uh, the flesh spirit uh, issue and in, in the translation of sarx, the Greek word for flesh. Um, dynamic equivalents, and this is not an evil or bad or malevolent thing, but they open the door for the translators to uh, bring in more of their theology, that which they understand, and, and the, the majority interpretation at that time of a passage, and uh, also their worldview. If they're Westerners, they're, unknowingly, they're going to bring in some of their Western worldview in the translation of a Middle Eastern uh, passages, Old Testament, New Testament. Now again, that's not e evil, malevolent, but it is, over the long haul, a weakness, uh, a vulnerability of these dynamic functional equivalents. And um, we've already seen that in uh, Romans 1.13 where uh, the uh, NIV translates the Greek word karpos, fruit, as harvest uh, because they want you to push you towards an evangelistic fruit understanding of it. So they use the word harvest. And in fact, we found that's really not what Paul was talking about. And, and so what you lose then is the continuity of checking fruit, whatever that is in Romans 1.13, with fruit in Romans 15, 28, when Paul revisits the fruit topic. But in the NIV, it's two different English words, harvest, fruit, and you don't even know, there's no continuity between the two. So see, you deeded that interpretive privilege uh, to the translators. And that's what most people want to do. Don't make it hard on me. I don't want to have to translate this. I don't have to understand this. I don't want to have to interpret it. You kind of interpret it for me. So these are the most popular in the United States. How about some of the other countries? Do, are they dynamic equivalent translations that have come out that are more popular than the older literal? Is that, is that fair? How about in Korean? Is there dynamic equivalent translations in Korean? Okay. All right. And so the literal, we already talked about that. You get the uh, paragraphing from the original, uh, the, the Hebrew Bible and the Greek New Testament. Uh, you get a, more precision in vocabulary. Uh, you don't, there is, Interpretation on the part of the translators isn't there, because there isn't any, when you go from one language anytime, there is interpretation. But there's less of it that you're deeding to the translators in a literal. You're deeding less, and, and they're passing on more of the problems to you. All right, so, but it's harder to read, and it's a little bit choppier. It's not as good a language, whatever uh, the language they've, you know, come into, the receptor language. So. Uh, you know, if, again, if you're reading a large chunk of scripture, it's, it's a, little, a little bit more wearisome to read it in a literal. But if I'm teaching a passage, I'd much rather be from a literal so I can really focus in on folks. Now, what the problem is, if people are sitting out there with dynamic equivalents, and you're in a passage where there's a significant difference between the literal and the dynamic equivalent, th then you're going to have to explain that to folks. And you want to explain it in a way that doesn't undercut their confidence in their dynamic equivalent translation. And sometimes that's a very interesting dance to do that. Say something like, now, okay, now that's an that's a acceptable translation, but I think perhaps a bit more precise would be what we have here in the American Standard or whatever the literal things. So you got to be careful on that. Uh, any questions about this? We're going to move on to a different thing here, but any? There's value in all of these. If you're working with youth, you probably want to use uh, the New Living or the NIV. Um, even the Good News Bible. That's even simpler than those two, so. 
Okay, now let's talk about uh, our issue in uh, Galatians 5.24, a really tough word. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified, in the Greek it's the word sarx, the sarx. And uh, uh, elsewhere in both the Septuagint, what's the Septuagint? The Greek translation of the Old Testament done between about 250 and 200 BC. And the Septuagint, uh, sarx, is used for flesh, meat on the bones, bodies, that sort of thing. Flesh and blood means human beings, okay? Uh, and in the New Testament, it's used that way too. So, uh, normally it has a bodily connotation. And so, uh, now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. So, if it, if it intuitively has a bodily sense, uh, then it seems when we read it counterintuitive to us, in that our flesh is still living after we trusted Jesus, you know. <laughs> we belong to him and our flesh isn't dead. It's still the meat on our bones, our bodies are still very much alive. So what in the world does it mean? So uh, then uh, all the literals, translations, do the flesh, the dynamic equivalents, and then seek to understand it um, in terms of a, a generally they go with a nature or an abstract entity. Now this is an interesting move from a bodily term, uh, a, a concrete entity, flesh, to an abstract entity, a nature. That's quite a leap, isn't it? Now why can Westerners do this quite easily? If we're talking about the body, and uh, uh, suddenly now uh, we feel the freedom with certain bodily terms to say, oh, it's not about the body itself, but it's about a nature that, in this case, empowers the body. How can we make that leap as Westerners? All those are true, uh, but also in the West, uh, we have a kind of unique thing in that we think a person's identity is hidden within them. And, and we would say, well, you know, you can't really know me based on what I do because you don't know my heart, you don't know my nature, you don't know my inner being. Hmm. Okay, run that through a biblical lens. What, is, what does the Bible say about knowing a person? <clears throat> what did Jesus say? You can tell a tree by its fruit. Wow. So, if when you get in your car, you're angry, you're wanting to make gestures to other drivers, but you've learned not to do that, but in your mind you're making <laughs> gestures, international driving gestures to them, uh, and you, you, know, you pass them or you honk your horn a lot, uh, and uh, if somebody were riding with you, a fellow believer, they say, gee, well, you certainly seem angry. And you'd say, no, no, I'm not an angry person. I'm a sweet, kind, gracious, loving person. You see, what then we're assuming is there's a disconnect between who I really am and my behavior. You know what? That's not biblical. There isn't really a disconnect. And we need to look at our behavior and the feedback from other members of the body of Christ and, and, and take that as uh, a word from the Lord for us, isn't it? If somebody says, and people have said to me, you sure seem angry or you sure complain a lot or you're, you sure seem to be kind of perfectionistic and, and mean-spirited sometimes, you know, the Lord uses the body of Christ to give us that feedback based on our behavior. And we shouldn't discount it, should we? Because you can tell a tree by its fruit, not by the root you claim to have, by its fruit. Of course, that's true if a person is a believer. You can tell over time, can't you? Okay, maybe not five years, maybe not even 10 years, but over 25, 30, 60 years, you can tell. If they say, oh, I invited Jesus in my heart when I was nine years old, and they have 70 years of godless living, now, only the Lord knows, but we, you know, we should put a big question mark by that, shouldn't we? Okay, well, 
let's, let's go on here. Let me ask you a question last week, and I, I don't know if we answered it, but where did Paul get the word flesh? You think he just made that up in, in the Galatians writing to them in our discussion? Who were his opponents? Who came in after he came in and confused these young Christians? You know anything about Galatians, Paul's letter? <coughs> Galatians? Judaizers. Judaizers, all right. Uh, and so these are uh, essentially Jewish Christians, all right? So do you think they used the word flesh in talking to these baby Christians about a year or so old in Christ, in Galatia? You think they, the Judaizers said, hey, let's talk about flesh. You think they used that? Is flesh a big deal in uh, Judaism? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, a really big deal. Okay. Uh, and uh, in fact, the Judaizers believe that, and this is page 37, I think. The Judaizers believe that uh, they, uh, God's people have a covenant in the flesh with Abraham. Galatians, or Genesis 17, 13, a covenant in the flesh with Abraham. Oh, well, what if you're born a Gentile? You're outside the covenant in the flesh, aren't you? So, what if you want to be a child of Abraham? What do you have to do? But you're a Gentile. You're an outsider. What do you have to do? Get circumcised, right. And what's the significance of circumcision? All right, it's, a, it's getting into the Abrahamic covenant. It's the mark of the covenant, literally a mark on the body of the males. What else? When did uh, the males get this mark, normally? Eight, Eight days old, okay. So, if you are born an Israelite or a Jew, and uh, you're male, you get circumcised the eighth day. If you're born a Gentile, and you, let's say a male, and you believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you're 35 years old, then you need to approximate a Jewish birth to get into the covenant in the flesh. How, what's the closest you can get? <laughs> the eighth day of a little Jewish boy's life. Eh? So circumcision is both a mark of the covenant, but it is, uh, practically speaking, it's approximating a Jewish birth, if you're a Gentile. And so what did the Judaizers say to these young baby Christians, these Galatians? It's nice that you believed in Jesus. That's a good move. We believe Jesus is the Messiah, but pardon? Yeah, you're not in the family yet. And you see, Paul, he took out all the difficult, hard things. Yeah, he just lopped off, so to speak, circumcision. <laughs> He just put that aside because that's not a good thing for Gentiles, is it? So he, he kind of changed things. He made uh, the good news even better for you Gentiles, didn't he, by doing this. And we're telling you we got the straight news from the apostles in Jerusalem, from Jesus himself. We're telling you the truth that circumcision is a part of your identity. If you're going to be a child of Abraham then you got to have the marks of the Abrahamic covenant on your body and that's how you will get into and all the women in your household will get into the covenant in the flesh with Abraham. Does that make sense? Now these are group oriented people and the Judaizers must have made a pretty good case. Hey, why would, otherwise would adult males and young boys who are old enough to kind of figure out the pain of circumcision, why would they be willing to submit to circumcision unless the Judaizers put together a really good argument? Group-oriented people, very painful to be left out, and so the Judaizers said, it's great you believe in Jesus, you're almost home now, now complete the identity process by getting these marks on your body. So Paul inherited the term flesh on the field of spiritual battle. You see that from his opponents. He didn't make it up. He's not just talking about uh, the nature of persons. He's, he's using a, a, a term of endearment to the Judaizers, to his opponents. And he's going to take it and turn it on its head. 
And so I'll give you a little quick summary of that here. Basically, he's going to say, my opponent's gospel, the Judaizers, is there's a gospel from men and through man, uh, but mine is through Jesus Christ and it's from the Father. Listen to the very first words that he says in the letter. And, and you say, gosh, he kind of started on a negative note. Not, instead of making positive assertions, he's kind of making negative things. Paul, an apostle, not sent from men, like his opponents, nor through the agency of man, like his opponents, but through the agency of Jesus Christ and God the Father. Now, here's an interesting thing. In the five verses of Paul's greeting, and we just read uh, the first verse, normally Paul uses the word Father one time. He uses it three times in his greeting, in verse 1, in verse 3, and in verse 4. He says, God the Father, God our Father, our God and Father. Three times. What is he saying? <laughs> Pardon? That's who, sent him. That's who sent him. And he's not just, God's not just his father, but he's their father. You see, the Judaizers are saying the opposite. God's not your father yet, because Abraham's not your father. And uh, Paul says, oh, no, ah, oh, contrary, no. God is your father. And so three times he's already pounding away at this in his greeting, for heaven's sakes. <laughs> okay. So he's, he's really coming after. So his point is that his gospel, which did not include these Judaizing things, came directly from Jesus Christ. It radically changed his life because he, quite frankly, was a better and more highly ranked uh, uh, Jew and Pharisee than any of his opponents that are, have been to Galatia. He's got a lot better Jewish resume than they do. They're smucks compared to him. He says uh, he advanced beyond all of his uh, contemporaries because he was far more zealous for the ancestral traditions, the very package that they're emphasizing and pushing now. He went well beyond them. But he basically says in these first two chapters that the gospel is not a gospel according to the flesh. Uh, and it isn't particularly limited to a certain people, but it is a universal gospel. And when the apostles in Jerusalem and the churches of Judea, and when he confronted Peter over this issue, they all agreed, yeah, Paul, you're preaching the right gospel, and we just got a little confused here, but you're preaching the right thing. So his gospel has the right historical roots, first two chapters. Chapters three and four, his gospel is, and now he introduces a contrast, a contrast between flesh and spirit. So now we're talking about identity markers. Which gospel, the Judaizers, which he calls a false gospel, which is really not a gospel, it's a non-gospel. <laughs> it's not a gospel alternative. It's not even worthy of the status of gospel. He says, okay, which one of these now gives you the true identity? They say flesh is the true identity to make you sons and daughters of Abraham. And so you've got to have the marks on your flesh and approximate a Jewish birth. Paul says, no, your true identity, if you're sons and daughters of Abraham, is the indwelling Holy Spirit. And so he's going to put flesh and spirit antithetical to one another, two competing, contrasting identity markers. Real quickly, Galatians 3, this is cool stuff. Galatians 3, verse 8, and then verses 13 and 14. A couple of my favorite verses here. Galatians 3, 8, and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all the nations or all the tribal groups shall be blessed in you. So the gospel Abraham got in 2000 BC was all the peoples of the world are going to be blessed through you, Abraham. And, uh, and that's why he needed a name, ch name change from Abram exalted father to Abraham, father of many peoples. Because through his line, through his seed, all the peoples of the world, all the people groups of the world were going to be blessed. And he's going to be father of them in some sense. All right? Now, uh, let me just say, is Abraham your father? Are you one of Abraham's kids? Yes, you are. Yeah. We've been grafted. You're in the family. Uh, how do you know that for certain? 
Okay, by faith, that's the means. Okay, here, I'll give you, here's the by certain part. Verse, chapter 3, verse 13 and 14 in Galatians. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Here's the payoff, verse 14. In order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. Abraham, through you I will bless all the peoples of the world. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. All right. So, in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Hmm. What is the Abrahamic blessing? What blessing, if you will, from Father Abraham did you get? Through Father Abraham, through his seed, Jesus Christ. What did you get? Well, Walt, I don't know. Let me uh, talk to my... Uh, okay, come on. What did you get? What does verse 14 says you got? What's the Abrahamic blessing? The promise, the blessing of Abraham might come to you, that which is promised. What was the promised blessing? Spirit. Spirit. The indwelling Holy Spirit. That's the mark of being sons and daughters of Abraham. To have the indwelling Holy Spirit. It's not marks on your body. It's not flesh. It's the indwelling Holy Spirit. That's the promised blessing. That means God is in you in the person and work of the Spirit and is among us as the people of God uh, who possess the Spirit individually and He is among us collectively as the body of Christ, as the sons and daughters of Abraham. So, here's Paul's point in Galatians 3 and 4, if you've got the Spirit, you're in the family of Abraham. And he ends this long, uh, interesting discussion in Galatians 3 and 4 with a little allegory that he creates. And this is, we scratch our heads on this. Uh, it's an allegory between Abraham who had two sons with two different women, you know, uh, uh, Isaac and Ishmael. Okay. Now, if the Judaizers were saying to these Galatian Christians, these baby Christians, you guys really are Ishmaelites. See, you're not from the line of Abraham through Isaac. I'm sorry, you're from the line that's not the promised blessing from Abraham through Ishmael. You're Ishmaelites. We, these true Israelites, we're the Isaacites. We're from Isaac. And Paul says, well, let's take that and look at that a little bit. Let's see. How was Isaac born? Well, let's do him first. Ishmael was born first. How was Ishmael born? Well, he says, according to the flesh, just the old, typical human way. <laughs> All right? How was Isaac born? Well, his mother was barren. She couldn't have a baby. And by the time they did have a baby, Old Abraham, he wasn't in the baby business anymore, baby-making business, was he? He was too old. So how was Isaac born? It was miraculous, wasn't it? Old mother, old father, the spirit had to empower both mama and both papa on this thing, okay? And so Isaac was born by the spirit, or according to the working of the Holy Spirit. So let's see, Ishmael was born according to the flesh, Isaac was born according to the spirit. What did God tell uh, uh, Abraham to do? What did he do? Well, he was born according to the spirit, drive out, he was born according to the flesh. And he says, as then, so now. <laughs> Those who are born according to the spirit, drive out all these who are pretenders to being sons and daughters of Abraham but they're not. They are actually the Ishmaelites. And we, who are born according to the Spirit, are the Isaacites. They're the children of the flesh. We're the children of the Spirit. Does that make sense? See, this is all stuff he inherited on the field of battle. And so he's making lemonade out of theological lemons from the Judaizers. <coughs> Boy, is he. And he's going to make them drink it. <laughs> and it's going to catch the Judaizers' hair on fire, isn't it? All right, now, 
first uh, a couple of chapters have to do with the gospel and its historical roots. Uh, it is through Jesus Christ and the Father. The second is about what's the true identity marker. It's not the flesh or circumcision. It's the Holy Spirit. That's Abe's blessing. Now, where does this cash out? Well, if you can tell a tree by its fruit, then how do these two gospels and these two identities cash out in terms of behavior or your lifestyle or your walk? See, that's the, that's the cash out, isn't it? That's where it all ends. That's where you can tell the fruit of what you believe and who your identity is. And so Paul says, okay, it's going to result in two very different ways of life. One is the walk of the flesh, and the other is the walk according to the Spirit. Two very different ways of life. And it's going to produce the deeds of the flesh, and by contrast, the fruit of the Spirit. Those are what the two Gospels and the two communities, it's the two contrasting ways of life that they. And so in chapters 5 and 6, he compares flesh life, flesh walk, flesh identity with spirit life, spirit walk, spirit identity. Oh, but we muddied all of that up. Because we decided, starting in chapter 5, that flesh equals a sinful nature. Wow. So, in the chapters 5 and 6, where Paul's cashing out his previous argument, we take a right turn in our translation and we make it something totally different. Something that's inside the person. And it's a sinful nature. And, and then with that, then, by pitting the sinful nature against the spirit, we now say, oh, a Christian is a combination of two natures at war in one another. You, according to this view, are schizophrenically divided. <laughs> you are, you ever have a, it's kind of an old analogy, you ever have a big, big bag, big burlap bag, and you, and you have a couple of puppies and you have to carry them, you know, across the yard or, you know, put them somewhere and they won't follow you, so you just put them in the bag and carry them. You have a bag with, you know, two dogs or two cats and it's just, that's the view of a Christian, is that we are a container with two warring natures, good dog, bad dog, and they're fighting one another like crazy. At the very core of our being, we're divided, according to this view, according to this translation. All right, now that, folks, is deeding a lot of interpretive authority to translators when they can express a, a, a popularly held view of uh, the makeup of a human being and of ident Christian identity and freeze that in a translation. Shame on them. <laughs> I know, they did the best they could. But here's the, here's the good news, and it's recent. I just learned this last semester. NIV, historically translated Sark's as sinful nature. The 2011 version, guess how they translate it now? Flesh. After 30 years of some of us beating their brains, I had a conversation with the, the, the chief translator, the, the general uh, editor of the NIV. He was one of my former professors, Dallas Seminary. And uh, he sat through a seminar where I'm challenging and trying to undercut the whole sinful nature thing and arguing for translating in his flesh. And uh, so he, he came up to me afterwards and I said, Prof, why did, you, why did you translate that as sinful nature? And then there's a little footnote down at the bottom, or flesh. And here's what he said to me. He said, oh, well, don't make more out of it than it is. I said, well, y you know, I, I'm not making a lot out of it. It's just people take this and it gives them a whole understanding of their struggle with sin. And there's a whole bunch of theology that comes with that. And if you think you're a walking civil war between these two natures, and that is the common view among Christians, isn't it? You taught that view? Sure, we all buy, bought into that, didn't we? The good news is, I don't think that's what Paul's saying. And the really, really good news is that NIV folks finally changed their mind. Because Gordon Fee, who was a key translator of the NIV, changed his mind. 
and he probably pulled the whole translation committee with him when they revised it in 2011 this year. Wow, that's good news. So if you got an earlier version of the NIV, <laughs> sinful nature, <laughs> at times they're a changing, <laughs> okay, <laughs> and they're going in the right direction, okay. Does that make sense? I don't want to beat this to death, but I did spend three years working on this. My doctoral dissertation was uh, the flesh spirit conflict in Galatians 5 and 6 and a lot of the argument of Galatians. So this is one of my hobby horses. Yes. Well, something changed. Uh, his human nature expressed the, the, the uh, propensity or the capacity to sin, didn't it? And it changed his human nature. And his body then, and all of our bodies from that point on, then were under the mastery of sin. And our human nature was bent, to some degree, to sin. Now the Mosaic Law came in for Israel, and it didn't defeat that, did it? It simply gave boundaries to it. Said, no, here are the boundaries. If you go past this, it's sinful. If you stay within this, it's not sinful but it didn't defeat, defeat that. When is the mastery of sin over our bodies, when was that defeated? The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So why does Paul say in Galatians 5, 24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. Not the body, that's a Greek word soma, but the sarx, the flesh. So what is the flesh? It is a weak, frail bodily identity that is uh, vulnerable to and subject to the mastery of sin. And the moment you believed in Jesus Christ, you moved from a weak, frail bodily identity vulnerable to the mastery of sin, you moved from being in the flesh to being in the spirit. And that changed everything. You say, but why do I still struggle with sin? Well, you have a new identity. You're no longer in the flesh, in a weak, frail body, on your own in the world, unaided by God. You're now in the spirit. Ah, but what did you bring with you into the kingdom of God? What did you bring with you? Your body. Thoughts, emotions, and bodily habits. You brought all that habituation to sin with you, didn't you? Yes, we did. And that's what we struggle against. But the good news is, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. Remember Jesus said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Well now, you have the indwelling spirit of God to help you with all of that weak, frail, bodily stuff, including our thoughts and emotions and, and bodily habits. And that is a battle that we are well equipped to win. We just don't believe it. And to gum up the works even more, we say that flesh is not something that died. Actually, it's a sinful nature that we brought with us. So for Paul, you see, flesh, is a, it's a term of discontinuity. It's something you left behind, a bodily state of weakness and frailty you left behind, and now you're in the, the realm of the spirit. But when we translate it sinful nature, it's actually, then the way we do it, it's something you brought with you. And, and then so they say, well, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified their sinful nature. Okay, then why do I still sin? If my sinful nature is dead, then it shouldn't be generating uh, sin in me. Well, uh, it's dead from God's perspective, but it's not dead from your perspective. So you have to reckon it dead. Okay, so it's dead, but it's not dead dead. All right, then we, now we're in theological <laughs> la la land. La 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 la. Uh, it's a bit clearer in Paul's theology than that, okay? A weak, frail, bodily state on your own in the world under the mastery of sin called the flesh, that ended. And now you are in the spirit. And you're indwelt and empowered by God's spirit. That's the good news. That's our identity in Christ. But you brought all 
of the junk with you. <laughs> the junk was in your whole trunk, okay, and you brought the whole trunk with you. Thoughts, sinful thoughts, sinful emotions, sinful bodily habits. And New Testament, Paul calls that fleshliness, the characteristics of having been in the flesh. We brought that with us. What's the struggle in the Christian life now? It's in light of our new identity in the spirit, it is putting to death the deeds or the practices of the body, which includes our thoughts and emotions. And that's a process, isn't it? And oh, by the way, that's why the church uh, developed spiritual disciplines over the years to help focus on different bodily or mental or emotional habit patterns that were sinful, to put those to death. So you're saying the flesh has been crucified and is not... Uh, no, I didn't say that. Paul said that. Right. <laughs> okay. So, okay. But you're saying the desires of the flesh are... Fleshliness, still, the characteristics of that. Yeah, all the habituations and that so we developed. some sort of internal battle between our spirit yeah, if we want to make it internal, but it, it manifests itself externally. So is it strictly internal? Uh, aren't there certain bodily habituations that are, they're not internal, are they? They're just, they're, bodies have a wonderful plasticity and we develop habits, don't we? Do you think about and choose to sin when you do something bodily that you're habituated to? No, it's habituated, isn't it? So I, I, I'm hesitant to say it's all an, in, it's all an internal thing. It's, it's a whole thing. We're, we, all of us was impacted by sin. Our thoughts, our emotions, and our bodily habits. And we can sin in any of those areas uh, habitually. And, and so here's the beauty. Again, we're jumping ahead. We'll get, deal with this later on, a couple of weeks. We can be habituated to righteousness. We can be habituated, right? So, when somebody cuts me off when I'm driving, you can tell I struggle when I'm driving, okay? Mm -hmm. Use these driving illustrations. If you are habituated to raise your hand, sin says, curl some fingers down, raise one finger up, give international driving side. If I'm habituated to that, okay, I've learned to do that. But now I'm in Christ, I'm a new creature, and somebody cuts me off, and that physical, and it's it, it, mental and emotional, that habituation, I can feel my hand rising. And then I think, hey, wait a minute. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. I have a new identity. And I don't have to do what I used to do. Because I'm not the person I used to be. I now have... Jesus Christ and in, in the Holy Spirit dwelling in me, and he helps me to put to death those prax, practices, it's Romans 8, 13, the deeds or the practices of the body. I don't have to do that anymore. I, I'm habituated to do it. I want to do it, but I don't have to do it now. See, before, I didn't really have a total, full, free choice, did I? because I was under the mastery of sin. No longer are you under the mastery of sin. Jesus' bodily death and his bodily resurrected ended the mastery of sin over the human race for all those who then join with Jesus under his authority and power and believe in him. Okay, I told you, this would just kind of confuse you a little bit. Paul use fleshiness? 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. 1 Corinthians 3, 1, 2, 3. I'll give you the short version. He says to the Corinthians, hey, when you first believed, and if it was the last day he was there, it was three and a half years ago, if it was the first day he was there since he spent 18 months in Corinth, it was five years previously from the time he's writing him. So it's three and a half to five years ago. When you first believed, you were fleshly. You were babes in Christ. Have you ever been around brand new Christians and they're in a Bible study? And, and they say some of the most unbelievable, outrageous things. You know, you're reading and studying about Jesus, and they'll say something like, okay, now, uh, forgive me for this. They'll say, man, that is effing wonderful. <laughs> All the Christians go, oh, oh what, what just happened in our sacred Bible study? <laughs> it was defiled by this. 
Uh, and then somebody takes him aside and said, you know, hey, hey, brother, I know this is all new in you, but uh, I'm going to use the words of First Corinthians, but this is, this is what Paul calls fleshly behavior. And these are things, as we grow in Christ, that uh, we choose not to do. These things uh, that we choose and, and let them drop off in language, in our you know, bodily habits, our thoughts, emotions. But it's a process. So, you know, but let me just give you a heads up that uh, most of us now, at least in front of one another, don't use the F word because it's, it's crass. It's just, it's a, a, it's a, a, a gross kind of word. It's, it's an inappropriate slang of, of a, a wonderful, beautiful thing between a husband and wife. So, you know, so you just kind of inform them, all right? And so every new Christian is fleshly, right? They're, they're a babe in Christ. They're fleshly. And, and that's okay, that's the, because it's a process to get rid of the fleshliness. But after three and a half years, the Corinthians were still fleshly, Paul says. And it's not okay now. And he gives exhibit A and B. Are you not still smoking and drinking and dancing? Right? No? What does he say? What are the, what are the clear exhibits of their fleshliness? Jealousy and strife among yourselves. Oh, does your church have jealousy and strife? Ouch. Oh, but we don't drink and smoke and dance. That's, that's admirable. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now let's get to the biggies. Jealousy and strife. Serious fleshliness, okay? All right. So, yeah, it, this is a process. And here's good, 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 good news. Jesus Christ enabled us with his death, burial, and resurrection, and then the sending of the Spirit to win the battle with our bodies. You have a new identity. The struggle now is bringing your thoughts, emotions, and bodily habits into conformity with your new identity in the power of the Holy Spirit. And it is a struggle. And that's where the spiritual disciplines also come in, where you can focus on not a sinful nature, but on the expression of sin in the bodily members. Remember what Jesus said? If your eye offends you, what are you supposed to do? All right, this is a hyperbole, all right? I don't want anybody going out and plucking your eye out. I do have examples, newspaper articles of Christians doing that. Okay. If your eye offends you, pluck it out. What if your hand offends you? What if your foot offends you? Cut. Deal with the sinning parts of your body. Okay. Not deal with the fight of sin nature, but deal with the sinful expressions. If it's in your eye, there's a sinful expression, deal with that. If it's in your hands, if it's in your feet, where you go, deal with that. See, it's very concrete and specific, isn't it? It's not abstract. I'm not fighting a nature. I'm dealing with the manifestations of sin in the members of my body, including my thoughts and emotions. Very concrete. Good news. Uh, body. He didn't all right. say from the sinful nature. Good point. And it's the first time I've seen that yeah. in this light now. Yeah. And there's going to be a lot more light coming on Romans 7. That's where you, yeah. Okay, good. Good point, though. In this body of sin. And see, that's the whole point. Jesus said to his sleeping disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Is it wrong to have flesh, to have bodies of fleshliness? No, it's not sinful to have a body. There's nothing innately sinful, the body. The problem is the body is instrumentally sinful. That is, as a non-Christian, before I came to know Christ, my body was an instrument of sin. It was under the mastery of sin, including my thoughts and emotions. So it's instrumentally sinful. And now in Christ, with this new identity, with the indwelling spirit, we are to go through that wonderful transformation process of the body to become instrumentally righteous. So that habitually you learn when somebody says something cruel and unkind, rather than to strike back and to curse them and to get angry or just to cut them off, you learn not to revile them and not to judge them. And you give the judgment to God. Yeah, see? And, and you are then, over time, 
we become habituated to righteousness if we're making these choices. That's, if the body has the uh, capacity to habituate, it can habituate to sin or it can habituate to righteousness. That's the beauty of it. And in Christ, through the process of uh, sanctification, we should begin that habituating to righteousness. Wes, you were going to say something earlier, did you? I had some questions. Do you have any like, books that talk about this? Books that talk about this. No. <laughs> I have one up here <laughs> that I've been working on. Yeah. I had a contract to write a book on this several years ago, but I didn't feel like I was enough of a practitioner of these things in my own life, so I didn't want to be known as an expert on it when I was still working through my own junk and my own holistic trunk. The whole trunk. Not just part of the trunk, the whole thing. So. But no, I, I will come, we'll, visit, we'll revisit this again and I'll see if there's something that's helpful. The writings of Gordon Fee in God's Empowering Presence, uh, that's when he studied through the, it's about the role of the Holy Spirit in Paul's writings. When he did that whole study of the Spirit, he changed his mind about it being a sinful nature. And he was one of the big uh, New Testament translators of the NIV. And in and, and a book that he and Douglas Stewart wrote, a very famous book, uh, called How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. The first two chapters are about translations, and it's like a, a you know, subliminal ad by the NIV, by the NIV, by the NIV. And, and, and they use the example of the sinful nature as this is why the NIV is so good, because you can explain these things like flesh with sinful nature. Now he changed his mind. I hope he goes back and changes that chapter in the book. But uh, if he does, he's going to have to trumpet the literal translations a little bit more. So, uh, but no, read uh, Gordon Fee, God's Empowering Presence, and, and he just goes through all of Paul's letters and uh, some beautiful explanations of these things. And he's totally changed. He went from one end to the other on this. Yeah? So you should really never use the term sinful nature again? I haven't used sinful nature for many years because I don't think we have one. We don't have a sin nature, we have a human nature that is bent and twisted to sin. And now in Christ, we have a new heart and the indwelling spirit, and we're about, uh, Jesus is about the process of the unbending and the untwisting of our human nature so that we can be what God designed human beings to be before sin, of which Jesus is the perfect example. So it's, it's much more holistic, see? We, are, we should be in the process of becoming fully human in terms of our, our and nature uh, and dealing with fleshliness and the distortions uh, and the tyranny of sin over us. And so we, have a, we don't have a divided identity. We have a new identity, but we have a very real war with our body and our thoughts and our emotions and the habituations that they all have, habituating to sin. But uh, I, I, again, I think it's right. Here, here's my little summary. Uh, we talked about this. The Old Testament, New Testament, flesh was a term of bodily weakness, limitation, frailty, but it was not sinful. It, it's God-given, but it's instrumentally sinful in that now, from Adam on, it was under the mastery of sin, wasn't it? So it became an instrument of sin. The problem is not with the body. It's a problem with sin's mastery over it. So Jesus came in a real non-sinful human body. See, you can be human. Sin is not an essential quality of being human, is it? Adam didn't have sin, did he? He was fully human. So Jesus has a fully human body, not under the mastery of sin. He leads a sinless life, and then he dies as a sinless atonement to pay for sin. And then he is raised again from the dead and defeats the mastery of sin and death over humanity. And, and Romans 6 says, you and I, when we believe in Jesus, that our lives are, the word is co-planted. They're intertwined now with Jesus' life and his history. And so that as he was raised from the dead, so are we, so that we can walk in newness of life. Resurrection life. Now you see, the devil doesn't want us to do that, so he lets us have for generations an all messed up, divided, shrunken, shrivel view of our identity in Christ. 
And Romans 7 is the frontispiece of that shrunken, shriveled identity, and we'll get to that in a couple of weeks. Okay. This is just a warm-up. Okay. The Judaizers made flesh a term of endearment. It's a term of strength and a means of becoming a child of Abraham. Instead of a term of weakness, they made it a, something to glory in. And, and, and so all that Paul does then, and, and they, you know, the approximating a Jewish birth via circumcision and all that. So Paul simply basically is going to revisit the biblical usage of flesh and show it's weak in the old covenant it needed the law but it's the cross it's the death of Christ that ended the era of flesh and law and then superseded it with the era of the Holy Spirit this is what we call redemptive historical argu argumentation on Paul's part flesh and law are, are used interchangeably they're not the same thing but they're from the same era from being under the mastery of sin that God gave his people the law to help them reign in sin. That's why he gave it to them. Did it conquer sin? No, it didn't. It just said sin is really, really sinful. And so here's some sacrifices you can do to, to pay for that sin. Sin is not defeated until the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And then the sending of the Holy Spirit. So Christians are characterized not by the flesh, a state of bodily weakness, it has been crucified. We are now to be characterized, are characterized by the indwelling Holy Spirit. And that changes everything. It's supposed to. But the living out of that is a process, isn't it? It's a process. Paul says in Romans 8.13b, if by the Spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the soma, the body, you will live. It's a process. Our state of weakness and vulnerability as a state, as a way of life, has ended. And now we have entered into the empowered state of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Do we manifest that empowered newness of life in the Spirit perfectly? Of course not, because we brought all of the fleshliness, all of those habituations with us. But over time, we should be increasingly less fleshly and more spiritual. Less of the characteristics of the flesh, i.e. fleshliness, and more of the characteristics of the Holy Spirit, i.e. spiritual. And that's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3 to the Corinthians. By now, three and a half to five years, you ought to have more characteristics of the Holy Spirit than you do of the flesh. But you're still primarily fleshly. You're still living and wallowing in all those old habits and old behaviors and that, even though you're indwelt with God, by God's Spirit and that that bodily state has ended. But you're still living it out. That's right. The crucifixion of that weak, frail, vulnerable body state, that ended. We just don't believe it. And the devil didn't want us to believe it, obviously, because that's shattering to him. If you and I have an identity that says, I don't have to continue in sin. I don't have to do stuff. I don't care if it's generational. For five generations in my family, you know, there's ways to deal with that spiritually. If it's, you know, there's demonic stuff or, or soulish propensities that have been passed on through nature or through the nurture of my family. We can deal with those things in Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and again, with the spiritual disciplines and, you know, with people that are skilled thoughtfully in terms of counseling and praying for us. And a good friend of mine, he specializes in that. And uh, we can win the battle with our bodies. We are smack dab in a culture that does not believe that. We live in a Western culture, American culture, is addictive. So here's what the Christian life looks like here. You live in the middle of an addictive culture, and so we're uh, justifying our addiction, all of our addictions, by saying, well, you know, you just got to go with it. That's just the way it is. That's just kind of what I do. It's just what I've always done, what my family's always done, that. So we justify that, and then you throw in the radical individualism, and so we're trying to live the Christian life secretly on our own, fighting all this addictive stuff. Uh, and then we have a shrunken and shriveled view of the Christian life that you throw in on top of that. Well, I can't do what I used to. I mean, I just, I just, 
uh, I can't do what I want to do. Oh, you know, all I can do is sin. And, and so that fits in nicely with it. And then we don't emphasize the power of the Holy Spirit. Hey, that's four or five pretty deadly characteristics, any of which would probably be fatal in and of itself, wouldn't it? But then you throw them all together. No wonder we're in a mess. But it starts with the biblical view of who we are. And then we live in community with one another in honest, authentic relationships. We tell each other the truth and we deal with our sin in a very concrete way. And then we begin to manifest as a community the beauty of Christ, of what God designed human beings to be like, that Jesus is the head of that new humanity. And we begin to collectively and individually manifest that. Isn't that exciting? That, that's good news. So all of what you rattled off, you know, individualism. Yeah, addictive culture. Uh, shrunken identity in Christ, not to emphasize the power of the Holy Spirit. Can be classified in the flesh in some sense. Well, it justifies continuing to live in a fleshly way and, and, and helps to, yeah, in a way kind of uh, make it secret, make it hidden. Well, what I'm thinking is if our beliefs are part of our flesh. Right. Yeah. 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 They are. To have wrong beliefs, distorted beliefs, yeah, that's a part of the twisting and the bending of sin. Yeah. Okay. Well, gosh, are you ready to talk about book charting? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll double up next time. I really, really, really didn't intend for this to go on this long. But this is, uh, I'd say this is a fairly important topic, wouldn't you? So, um, let me just say, I hope for you the good news just got gooder. <laughs> I know that's bad English, but the good news really is good news, and this is a part of the good news. This is not a secret of the Christian life. This is not an extra experience you need to have. This is just a part of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news. He died to pay for your sins. He rose again to give you newness of life, and that is good news to be continued. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.